Is there a good, is there anything good about holding Bitcoin itself if it's not going up? In other words, during these drawdown cycles, is there anything about the asset that makes it an attractive thing for you to hold? First of all, it's, it's the, the hardest money on earth. It's, a, it's an institutional grade safe haven asset. It's, it's gold without all the imperfections of gold on a digital monetary network that moves at the speed of light that you can program uh, to, to do a million transactions a second. So Bitcoin is digital gold on a big tech monetary network. Why would you want it? You would want it be for the same reason that you want to run electric power to your city or you would want to run running water to your building because civilization is based on clean energy, clean water, clean communications, clean money, right? It, it is uh, an extraordinarily right. important thing. Now, uh, with regard to companies, I think the real issue here is, is if the if every currency is correlated to the dollar, right? I mean, they're all trading against the dollar. So if the dollar is weakening, every other currency is weakening, and then every stock and bond and commercial piece of real estate that generates fiat or US dollar cash flows, or any cash flows in a fiat currency, they're all correlated assets, and they're all correlated ultimately to the dollar. So if we create 15% more dollars every year for the next 10 years, right. then you've got to discount the cash flows of every other instrument by 15% a year. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that 80 to 90% of the value in those instruments is going to be collapsing if the dollar collapses. So if you want to preserve shareholder value, you have to buy scarce assets. Now, well, I, me, I could look for baseball cards or Picassos yeah. or sports teams, but it's hard to buy a billion dollars of liquid, scarce but, trophy assets. So Bitcoin is the most liquid, scarce, uncorrelated asset that you can buy if you're trying to do this in a treasury. I think conventional treasury strategy is now intellectually and morally bankrupt, and it's a road to serfdom. Right. And and I think that uh, what you're going to find is increasingly it, there, there's haves and have nots. Right. There's the elite that have incredible power, like the Googles and the Amazons and the Apples, and they have more money and more power and more distribution than God. And then you've got conventional businesses that have have conventional cash flows and they're being increasingly marginalized. So uh, to ask those businesses to, to invest all their capital in a currency, which is de devaluing at 15% or 20% a year, is pretty much committing economic suicide. I think it's pretty clear that we have a Main Street versus Wall Street dichotomy here. And if you have uh, a company that is asset rich, then you've got a 25% boost due to money printing of the Fed over the past 12 months. That's the M2 money supply expansion, roughly. And if you have a company which is, which is cash rich and asset poor, your business is just getting exponentially harder and any cash that you have is being degraded right. at the same 25%. The S&P is up 24.61% which means that if you want a proxy for cost of capital, if you invested in any kind of company that, that was up 5% over the past 12 months, you're not keeping up with even the index, right? right? So if you're, if you're an active investor, you're gonna have to find a way to get above 24%. Look, I don't think a company can be successful if it doesn't have a large asset portfolio in an environment where you've got such aggressive monetary expansion. If you had an environment where money was expanding at 0% a year, then you could, you could focus upon the manufacturing of things. But in right. an environment where the money is expanding at 20% a year, everything you're doing in the future is being discounted by 20%. So in essence, as the money supply expands, all the future activity of every business is being discounted until it exponentially goes to zero, which means that the only path you have in order to create or preserve shareholder value is to, is to forward finance your cash flows. Like you have to look out 20 years, borrow against 20 years of cash flows and convert it into an uncorrelated asset, which is going to appreciate faster than the rate of money expansion 
Otherwise, and you can see this in Venezuela or Argentina, right. the business as an enterprise or the enterprise value right. of the business goes to zero as the money supply expands. You don't have a choice. Uh, one of the important things about Bitcoin is that I can send you a payment or you can send me a payment without the permission of any sort of third party regulator or bank or entity that can say no. The sort of pure peer to peer cash online. From a regulatory or institutional perspective, is there any anxiety about holding an asset which has so much ability to essentially evade censors, evade capital controls, evade uh, taxpayers. And are you worried about that uh, tension at some point down the road, the intersection of institutional holdings and the sort of like original cypherpunk roots of the currency? I think the underlying integrity of the network, which allows you to take personal custody of your assets, uh, it, it, it creates the uh, the foundation upon which to create an institutional grade store of value. And without without that integrity, you couldn't be sure that your custodians would treat you fairly. But having said all that, I think every institution is purchasing Bitcoin through through regulated custodians. Right. And so, you're buying it in lieu of gold or uh, our choices, if we wish to avoid insolvency, are you buy gold, you buy a portfolio of stocks, perhaps you go and you buy a bunch of timberland or oil contracts or some kind of commodities. Companies have to become asset rich if they're going to prosper and, and, and uh, maintain shareholder value. So Bitcoin is the highest quality property right. that they can buy. As the regulatory environment is already pretty clear on this. I mean, AML, KYC regulations have been applied across all of these exchanges. Right. I think that there's a little bit more parity and precision that will be delivered in the coming one to two years. I think that's going to be the green light for institutions to invest 10x to 100x more into Bitcoin. So I think it'll be good for the industry in general. Let me ask you, um, you know, if a, a CEO came to you and maybe they weren't that tech savvy or whatever, they said, how should I, I wanna buy some Bitcoin. I don't know how to hold it. How do you hold your coins as a company? Do you have access to the private keys or does it make sense for companies to just hold their Bitcoin with a third party custodian? No, no, I think for any kind of, for, for a private or a public corporation, if it's really a corporate entity, it makes sense to use an institutional grade custodian. And there's, there's a, a good dozen of them that you can choose from. If you go to our website or go to hope.com, we've got a, we've got interviews with uh, 10 of the more notable ones in the marketplace. I, I think that the use the use of Bitcoin for institutions is going they're, they're going to access it through derivatives. They're going to they're either going to buy funds that are backed with Bitcoin like Grayscale or other kinds of funds. They may buy the underlying asset through an institutional grade custodian, but they'll fundamentally work at those three levels. I think that there are uh, individuals will want to take personal custody of their Bitcoin, and right. there'll be me, other entities that do that. And they they're the uh, the minority, but they provide the integrity to the system that keeps everybody else honest. And I think that's the important you, role they play. What is it about Bitcoin specifically that, in your view, makes it a logical asset for uh, companies to at least put some of their money in? Well, uh, I mean, let's look at the big picture. I've been a public company officer for 22 years. When you could generate five to six percent short-term interest on treasuries, uh, and you thought that the cost of capital was seven percent, then you didn't have to consider anything other than a conventional treasury strategy. You're maybe taking a minus two percent yield per year. I think that uh, when treasury, conventional treasury assets started yielding two percent, and you had a cost of capital of seven percent, which is the expansion of the money supply. It became a minus 5%. People, uh, they grit their teeth and they got through it. That was for the past four, five, six years. Now we've seen the cost of capital explode. It's 25% money, monetary supply expansion. The treasury strategies are now zero, one, one, less than 1%. So you've got a minus, a negative real yield, minus 25%. That's the cost of capital. That's actually turning up the heat that's causing everyone to realize that conventional treasury strategies are broken. Now, what are you going to do? Look at the last 12 months, ROI. Uh, Bitcoin is up 461%. S&P is up 25%. If you invested all of your treasury assets in the spider in the S&P index, you kept right. up with the cost of capital. NASDAQ's up 53%. Biz te uh, big tech 
their monopolies, they're extraordinary, they're staying ahead of the cost of capital. Treasuries down 7.7%. If you were holding long bonds like TLT, that's a disaster. Gold up 9%. It's also a disaster. It's not keeping up with the cost of capital. So why Bitcoin? Well, yet you can't hold conventional treasuries. You're looking at a negative real yield against the cost of capital of 15 to 25% a year. Right? right. I mean, I'm not a consumer. I have to control. I, I have to manage shareholder value. And if you want to maintain or grow shareholder value, you're going to have to grow your assets at a great at a, at a rate faster than the cost of capital. So your hurdle rate is 15 percent. Now, what are you going to do? It is. And I think I think that a lot of people think about inflation. I think CPI, the cost of capital has always been in, in a conventional environment, risk free, six, seven, eight percent. If you talk to any institutional investor in the past decade and you said, my idea is I'm going to invest your money at 1% or 2% or 3% interest, they would have asked for it back. In fact, there's not a single institutional investor that can keep limited partner capital by promising 1% or 2 or 3% returns. So all investors know the cost of capital, it's about 7 or 8 Look, if you look at the compound annual growth rate uh, of the S&P over a decade, it's 11.4% for the past decade. If you look at NASDAQ, it's faster, it's 17%. Big tech is better than the S&P. If you look at the compound annual growth rate of Bitcoin for the decade, it's 198%. Okay, so why Bitcoin? I have to move my money. Look, either got two choices, decapitalize the company or right. invest the money into something which is going to keep uh, up with the cost of capital or exceed the cost of capital. So let's talk about giving the money back. The road to serfdom would be for you to surrender all your assets and take a job working exponentially harder for cash, growing exponentially weaker. You, no family on earth would do that. No investor is going to give all their capital back to the limited partners Right? No endowment's going to work. No university, no, no company can function by surrendering all their capital and then working harder exponentially for a currency growing weaker. And one more point, the robots are taking over the country. We're automating everything. So for Amazon to succeed, 15,000 retailers are destroyed. For Google to succeed, 15,000 media companies are destroyed. For Apple to succeed, 15,000 device manufacturers are destroyed. So right. every company is competing against Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook. These companies are dematerializing their products and their ship. Microsoft can bundle a product, ship it to 80 million companies over the weekend. Now, how are you going to make money if you pretty much well, give up me, all your capital and you start working to create a new product to compete against Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, or Google when robots are taking over the world.